Welcome everybody. It's so good to see so many here. This webinar on uncertainty analysis in groundwater modelling projects. So glad that Luke Peters could join us for CSIRO to present this webinar. Uh, my name's Trevor Piller. I'm the National Partnerships Manager here at ISWARM and the Australian Water School, which runs these webinars. Look at you all there from Australia to Peru. Um, what a commitment. I mean, what time is it in Peru today, right now? Something in the middle of the night, I'd say. But thank you for joining us, everybody. That is just fantastic. Coming up, we've got uh, a ton of free webinars you can see there. I won't go into each one there uh, right now, but uh, you can go on the website for the uh, for Ice Warm and you'll see you'll see all the details of when they're on. But pretty much every week or two weeks uh, through the next few months through to, to November. Uh, also, the online course there in surface water modelling, HEC, HECRAS in this case, uh, with Cray Price. We'd love you to join us for that as well. All right. Luke Peters from CSIRO, with over seven years research experience in modelling groundwater dynamics at regional continental scales for water resource management. Luke's research features a strong emphasis on maximal exploiting the information from data to reduce predictive uncertainty. I won't read this right out, but he champions interdisciplinary research uh, to address the last line's a big one, the nation's grand challenges in finding and managing groundwater. That is it is, that is exactly where we're going today, and uh, uh, so good to have you with us, Luke. Welcome, Luke. It is fantastic. I notice you have an accent uh, because we've known each other for some time, <laughs> so I definitely noticed. Where did you Where did you study? Where did you originally study? Uh, so I I grew up in uh, in Belgium uh, and studied at University of Leuven. Um, that's where I went through my my masters and my PhD. Uh, trained there as geologist drifted into groundwater modeling and statistics, and that landed me a job here at CSIRO in Adelaide in 2010. And that's what I've been doing ever since. A fantastic drift, I would have thought. Uh, you, you don't regret being in Australia from Belgium. Not at all. <laughs> but, but Belgium's your home country, home country originally. Yes. yes. Yep. Okay. Mm. That's great. I think I've said enough, and we'd be delighted to hear from you now, uh, Luke. Great. Thanks for that introduction, Trevor, and if I clicked all the right buttons, you should you have. see my uh, PowerPoint right now. In rich so, color, aqua. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, and sorry, I did not choose a color scheme. That is the CSIRO corporate <laughs> color scheme. <laughs> anyway, um, now thanks for that. That poll uh, just before we started actually was quite insightful for me because it was hard for me to judge what the target audience would be. Um, but I saw that there's a really good mix between people who are actually uh, building these models and people using these models. And it's especially uh, for those two, groups. Uh, the way I thought of this uh, this webinar, it's really about how do you approach uncertainty analysis in groundwater modeling projects. A 25-minute presentation, it's not going to be enough to go in very great detail about the intricacies of um, the statistics behind it. But what I want to get across is a bit of an overview of what techniques are available, what are the main advantages and drawbacks, and both if you're building or reviewing or commissioning models, what are the things to particularly pay attention to? So, sorry, I'm just trying to get to the next slide. Here we are. So, to me, in essence, uh, one of the biggest or the main aims of a groundwater model is to quantify the probability of an event happening, some event related to uh, groundwater management like pumping or drawdown occurring. Um, and in this, uh, in this context, in the way I use probability, it's really the Bayesian view of a probability expresses a belief in our results, a confidence that we have in our results, an expression of how certain we are. And ultimately, at the end of a groundwater modeling project, I want to make, be able to make statements like, there's a 95% probability that drawdown is going to be less than two meters. Now, that's a pretty short statement, um, but what it actually means, if you start unpacking that, if if I run this model 100 times with different parameter combinations that are all consistent with the data uh, and the observations that we have, there will be five model runs in which a drawdown will be larger than two meters. And that's pretty much what I try to visualize here. If you've got 100 model runs, five of them will have results in excess of that, that threshold. Now, how do you use that kind of information in, um, in groundwater management? The way I look at groundwater management, it's an exercise in decision making under uncertainty. There's a certain event that we want or don't want to happen. And to make sound decisions, we need to know what is the risk of that decision. And for that, we don't only need to know what is the probability of that event occurring, but also what is the potential consequence. Just to illustrate that, uh, let's say there is a groundwater model that predicts um, 
a 5% probability of two meters drawdown at a location, that the risk of that uh, decision will be very different depending whether that drawdown is occurring at a bore um, that might run dry but is easy to uh, redrill versus a cri critical groundwater dependent ecosystem where um, which is much harder to replace if you can replace it at all. So that level, so in that um, decision making, it's not just the probability from of the groundwater model that plays a role, it's also the consequence and what as a manager you can define as an acceptable probability. Now, if I go back to that first slide, um, that simple statement at the, at the beginning, when I read that there's actually a couple of red flags and alarm bells that start ringing in my head, um, things that I'm mindful about when I'm uh, modeling or looking at modeling projects. And the first one is that top statement, 95 probability of more than two meters drawdown. That is the, the essence of your groundwater model. That is what you are trying to model. And that is something that needs to be very carefully defined, not just by the modeler, but by the entire modeling team and the stakeholders of what is the event that we're trying to model, what is the consequence um, of that event occurring, and what is a probability that is deemed accept acceptable in our decision making. Now, that is the kind of very high level def defining your project. But if you then drill into the details, um, there's that phrase, different parameter combinations. And that, to me, raises two questions. Which parameters are you including? And how did you choose 100 of these values? Um, and then finally, consistent with, with the observations. What, that does, what does that mean? How do you define being consistent with observations? So these four questions or four choices that you need to make, that's what I, try, what I wanna try to focus on in this uh, webinar today. So just to give you a bit of an example of that first choice that defining uh, your model project, this has been a project I've been working on uh, last couple of years. Um, the bioregional assessments in the Clarence Morton region in the uh, north of New South Wales. Um, and basically, the event that we were trying to uh, estimate or quantify the probability of was the probability of a drawdown in a water table aquifer uh, from um, coal seam gas water production uh, deeper in the sedimentary basin. And what we're really interested in, what is the probability of that drawdown exceeding two meters? Now, the consequence of this uh, in, in this particular case was that um, we were looking at reduced yield in existing bores. And for the purpose of this modeling exercise, we defined the acceptable probability of uh, at 5%. Now, the map that you see here, and that's um, details of uh, how we got that map, you can find in, the, in this publication in Journal of Hydrology, um, shows the 95th percentile uh, drawdown at the water table. So that means that 5% of our simulations had drawdowns larger than that. And if you look at the color map uh, or the color scale of this graph, you see that the largest value on that map is just above 20 centimeters. So in this case, we were quite confident in stating that um, the probability of exceeding two meters drawdown is very much less than 5%. Now, how does this feature into a groundwater modeling workflow? Um, if you start developing your model, there's a, a heap of model choices that you need to make. You have to set your boundary conditions, geometry of your system, your properties, and all of them can, uh, you will need to put numbers on there. Um, and that's what I call parameters. So in, in the way I look at a model, any number in a groundwater model that you can change can become a parameter and can be subject to an uncertainty analysis. So once you define these numbers or these ranges of numbers, you feed them into your model, and they'll end up producing your, the prediction of your event or a range of predictions of that event so that you can start computing probabilities. Anyone who has ever been involved in a groundwater modeling project knows that there's a lot of professional judgment goes into building those. There's only in, in find, coming up with the structure, coming up with these uh, parameters. Um, and not only just in the design, but also in the evaluation. It's also looking at the output, looking at the groundwater potential maps, at the fluxes, the water balances, to judge whether they're um, consistent with the way you understand the system. Now, that's a, um, there's that professional judgment, but there's also the more uh, the very objective, trying to match historical observations, where you tune your parameter values so that the simulated values are as close as possible to uh, your historical observations. 
So in an uncertainty analysis, um, that's what I refer to as a quantitative uncertainty analysis. That's really where the focus is on is how can we make sure that we select parameters that are consistent with these historical observations. Um, but equally important is the qualitative uncertainty analysis. That is systematically going through all of these choices and assumptions that you embedded in your model and how they might affect your prediction. And they might be an equal, if not greater, part of your total predictive uncertainty. So this publication here on, uh, that at the bottom, the assumption paper in, assim, sorry, assumption hunting paper in groundwater uh, from last year provides a systematic approach of documenting and evaluating such uh, professional judgment calls in model building. But today, I'm mostly focusing on those uncertainty quantification approaches. So if you dive into the academic literature on uncertainty analysis, um, you'll literally find hundreds of techniques. And they're all very, uh, very or slightly different. Um, and summarizing them is obviously a pretty hard task. What I do here is a very high level overview of um, these uncertainty quantification uh, techniques. Um, and I'll just listed them from rather straightforward to very complex. So first of all is scenario analysis with subjective probability, um, which is pretty much in uh, what in traditional groundwater modeling exercises is referred to as sensitivity analysis. You take your calibrated model and you one at a time change one or two parameters with a predefined um, perturbation. So for instance, you increase a parameter by 10% decrease and you discuss the results. Um, the advantage is that it's a very straightforward approach. It's very easy to explain, and the novel number of model runs required is usually less than the number of param uh, parameters that you have in your model. One of the largest drawbacks, however, is that it is really hard to quantify the probability of these perturbations. So how likely is a 10% increase of your hydraulic conductivity? Um, and although you can have a look at how it changes your calibration uh, metrics, all in all, it will, will remain a subjective call and you will, it's very hard to go beyond very subjective statements like it is unlikely or extremely unlikely. So to bring, to bring a bit more uh, statistical rigor into that process, you can go the next step up, which is the deterministic modeling with linear uncertainty quantification. Um, you start from the same spot, you start with a calibrated model and you assume that the model behaves linear close in the, in the vicinity of those calibrated parameter values. And on, you assume that most of your parameters can be described with normal or log normally distributed, um, that the parameters are normally or log normally distributed, and that your predictions are also normally distributed. Um, by applying uncertainty, propaga uh, uncertainty propagation equations, you can then transfer that uncertainty from your parameters to your predictions. And for each prediction, you will get a normal distribution characterized with the mean and a standard deviation which you then in turn can use to start calculating what would correspond to, for instance, the 95th percentile of your prediction range. This is slightly more involved than the scenario analysis and you'll need at least two model runs per parameter to calculate that. Um, and again, there is a lot of more statistical rigor behind it, but it hinges very much on those linearity and normality uh, assumptions. If those don't hold for your um, uh, modeling project, you can go another step up where you go to the stochastic approaches with Bayesian uncertainty quantification. So rather than relying on least linearity assumptions, you actually create an ensemble of model runs by sampling different parameter values. Um, and in theory, you can use an arbitrary um, distribution for your inputs. And the results will typically be these kind of histograms of outputs uh, that can have an arbitrary shape. Um, downside. Uh, the downside of that is that you will need many more model runs per parameter at a very least more than 10. And just the advantages, disadvantages, I try to summarize on the, on the right hand side with these arrows. So if you go down, there's you increase the number of model runs, which comes of obviously at a, at a cost, uh, both in time and computational expense. Um, but what you what it allows you is to be more flexible uh, in the assumptions that you need to make about um, your model. The downside is that the transparency decreases because these techniques become more complicated. There are a lot more intricacies that you have to be uh, on top of. So communicating that becomes a bit more challenging than 
communicating a straightforward scenario analysis. But overall, the big thing that I'll continue on the rest, uh, in, the, in this webinar is that each of these techniques will have um, subjective model choices that you need to be aware of and that you need to be able to document and justify. Now, I'm just going to pause here for a moment um, and take any questions if there are any. Yeah, we just uh, thought, um, considering the complexity of this webinar, that we just make room if there were any um, discussion points or, or questions at certain points through the presentation. And, and then um, if there's not, that's fine. We'll move straight on. We've got a, a full hour. I just want to assure everybody that we will be over in one hour. That they don't go longer than an hour, these webinars, and, and sometimes less, but uh, depending on the level of discussion. But uh, look, there isn't anything uh, coming up right now. Uh, Luke, so I reckon we press straight on. People are probably um, uh, digesting what you're saying. And uh, let's just move straight on to the next section. That'll be great. But do, by okay. all means, everybody, put your... Um, Put your uh, questions or comments up. Uh, one there just come up and now I noticed um, as I'm just uh, going on to the next section. Uh, Vincent uh, has asked how how to how is it how to easily test if the linearity assumption is valid for a given model. Uh, how do we test if the linearity assumption is valid for a given model? Okay, and in some simple cases, you can just start from the first principles, um, looking at the groundwater flow equations to figure out whether uh, the way a prediction like a groundwater level uh, prediction will change in function of a parameter value. Um, but unfortunately, especially in the more complex models, that's not possible. So you will need to run um, a range of models just to see how linear that model is. So one of the approaches that we are currently using is before we start the uncertainty analysis to do a stress test of our models, where we run our models, let's say 10 or 20 times with a range of parameter values just to see how stable our model is, but also to get a feel of how linear our responses are. So that's a pr very pragmatic approach, but there are, and I can expand on that later, there are a couple of more rigorous techniques um, that unfortunately will always involve running the model a couple of, uh, a number of times. No, sounds great. Well, uh, there's another one uh, from uh, Adrian Werner. Uh, Adrian Werner is in Flinders in, in Adelaide. Perhaps this will come later, said Adrian, but I'd like to know how Luke thinks his summary fits within the groundwater modelling guidelines, which methods are recommended for which projects, and thinking about the statutory perspective. Um, okay. Um, I, won't I, I won't dwell on this too much, and I, and I was very purposely avoiding any word of uh, guidelines in this presentation. Um, but this is just my personal take on uh, uncertainty analysis. Some of these concepts are uh, part of new explanatory notes um, that are being developed in Australia. But at least in principle and in, um, in, uh, in concept, everything that I'm presenting here is consistent with what already is uh, published in the Australian Groundwater Modeling Guidelines. Yep. yep. No, that's really good. Though. I appreciate that question, Adrian. Thanks very much for taking the time to, to uh, think through some of these things. Uh, all right. Well, we'll press right on then, shall we? Uh, over to you. Okay. Thanks. Um, so, continuing on, one of the big questions that often comes back in these uh, groundwater modeling co um, projects is how complex to make, sorry, to make your groundwater model and how involved to make your uncertainty analysis technique. Because obviously, there's a lot of um, it's the timing and the budget to allow for these things. Now, the way I look at it, it's really that question of complexity depends on how conservative you want to be in your, um, in your modeling. In the early stages of your model, um, when you have very little data, um, it's often preferable to go for a rather simple model um, and a straightforward uncertainty analysis. But the downside, the only way that you can justify these, uh, these simplifications is to make sure that these assumptions are very conservative, that you're overestimating probability. So when you make statements that you still are very confident that you are overestimating these probabilities. When more data, as more data becomes available, you can then start increasing the complexity of your model. So increasing the uh, complexity usually means adding more parameters to the, uh, to the model. That can, more parameters will allow you to in, uh, integrate more data, but also to nuance and relax some of those conservative assumptions, um, which then will lead to a more nuanced probability. Um, of an event happening, hopefully um, reducing that probability, but still remaining uh, having 
uh, high confidence in your uh, model result. Now, that is a very, I'm just touching the surface, obviously, of that complexity debate. If you want to have a bit more insight, I can highly recommend this paper by Franklin Schwartz in Groundwater last year that touches on that interplay of complexity and simplicity in modeling. Now, just to illustrate that uh, complexity and that uh, iterative model development, um, the example I uh, showed earlier about the Clarence Morton uh, by regional assessment, we didn't start straight away building this uh, a very three-dimensional uh, mod flow model uh, with a very involved um, uncertainty analysis technique. What we did first was make a very uh, simple analytic element model and ran it a thousand times with uh, a wide range of parameter values unconstrained by the data. What that uh, model, that simple model tell, told us was that um, the 50, the median of our results was well below the two meter uh, drawdown uh, threshold, but our 95th percentile was quite considerably above that. So that enough was for us uh, enough reason to say, well, we need to be a more complex model and relax our uh, assumptions on uh, being conservative. And that's what we then did in the, that um, more complex model, which then showed that are actually, yes, we were greatly overestimating the probability and the more nuanced probability um, resulted from that complex model. Now, going back to the how to choose parameters in your model. So um, there's basically two types of parameters that you want to include. And again, as parameters, I mean everything that can affect your prediction. That can be the number of model layers. It can be a boundary condition. It can be a hydraulic property of your model. Anything that you can change in an automatic way in your model can be included as a parameter. Now. What you definitely want to have in there are the parameters that are important for your prediction, but you also want to have the parameters that are important to reproduce your historical observations. Um, this example, again, comes from that, um, that Clarence Morton groundwater model. The bar on the left is the drawdown. Those, those are the, um, that bar, the blue bars, shows which parameters are uh, important to make drawdown predictions. The two bar charts on the right, um, those were the observations that we had available, so river flux and groundwater level. And in this case, which was quite extreme, but they didn't coincide. So the parameters that we could co constrain by um, with our data uh, were not the same parameters that were important for our drawdown. So that meant, in this case, calibration was not reducing uncertainty in our predictions. Now, figuring out which parameters doing uh, um, whether a parameter is important for a prediction or whether it can be constrained by observations. Um, there's a lot you can do just from first principles. Again, this paper from Henk Heichema in 2006 gives you a couple of rule of thumb on um, what can be important for your groundwater model. But like for the linearity question, uh, you often will have to run your model a number of times and do a formal sensitivity analysis like we did here um, to figure out which parameters are important for which predictions. Um, and that leads us to the that next, uh, once you chose that those uh, parameters to include, um, you need to provide initial values or initial ranges to pri uh, what we call the priors on your parameters. Um, they will have a very strong influence on your calibration and or um, uncertainty quantification. Um, and especially as I just showed in that extreme case where uh, your predictions are sensitive to parameters that you can't constrain with observations. Whatever value you pick as prior will ultimately be affecting your prediction. So I can't stress this enough that you need to spend quite a lot of time defining and justifying those prior parameter values and don't just rely on the calibration process uh, to estimate them. Now in the scenario analysis uh, technique, um, often that prior range you take the baseline value, which is your best calibrated model, and then you take uh, something like 10% plus or minus. In the linear technique, um, you're often limited to specifying uh, initial ranges through uh, normal distribution. So you have to take a mean and a standard deviation. Often the mean is taken to be the, calib uh, the calibrated value. Um, and with the stochastic approaches, in theory, they are, excuse me, um, in theory, there are, uh, you can use any distribution, even empirical ones. So you can take whatever histogram or ensemble of parameter values and run it through your model. Um, in practice, however, 
people tend to go for distributions that can be uh, described analytically with, a, with an equation like the normal distributions or beta or Laplace distributions. Um, just a bit of an example again on, how, on uh, prior information. This is from uh, a project that we did uh, last year where um, we were interested in um, the vertical conductivity of an aquitard in New South Wales. Um, we used bo uh, bore log data um, to estimate um, these uh, KV values. We had about 60 values. Now, if you look at the histograms on the, on the, on the left, you, can't, you see that they can't really be captured in a, very, um, in a traditional normal or log normal distribution. So in this case, we um, just described them as a, um, as a triangular distribution. Uh, note that the uh, x-axis is on the log scale here. Um, we used them in our model um, where we sampled the aquitard value as a spatially uniform value from this dis distribution. Um, using these unif spatially uniform values, that was actually a pretty conservative approach. So we then um, made that more complex by using a geostatistical simulation where each pixel gets assigned a normal distribution with a, a mean and a standard deviation according to the spatial distribution of the data points. So that resulted in a spatially heterogeneous field, but still consistent with the same data set, which resulted in a less conservative assumption and changed our predictions um, accordingly. Going beyond that, that was about specifying which parameters were to pick your prior values. But then the, the other crucial part in, uh, in uncertainty analysis is from those prior parameters to select the ones that are consistent with the data. So that's really coming back to the calibration question. And as most people who have ever done a calibration, um, you may usually stop calibrating when their money runs out. Um, so, in, however, in theory, a good model fit is defined when the mismatch between your observed values and your simulated values is almost the same as your observation uncertainty. So as soon as you can't tell those two apart, you can consider your model to be well calibrated. Now, observation uncertainty has a couple of aspects to it, and one of, one of them comes straight from the measurement accuracy. So just on the graph on the right here, if you take um, the groundwater level measurement, um, there is some uh, uncertainty in your logger itself. There might be some uh, inaccuracies in the surveying of the bore um, that result in a range of value uh, in, a, uh, in an observation uncertainty um, depicted by the, the arrows. However, this is just a snapshot in time. In reality, it's a dynamic system. So um, you have the time series of groundwater levels um, plus the additional uh, measurement accuracy. But on top of that is that your groundwater model is discretized, both in space and time. And you're often only um, calculating a single value for a number of days, let's say, or on a monthly time step. So that's another thing that you need to take into account in your observation uncertainty is that you not just take into account um, the measurement uncertainty, but also um, the resolution in space and time um, of your model. Um, one way to reduce observation uncertainty and where you can eliminate some source of, sources of uncertainty in the observations, uh, it's through uh, differencing of data, um, either in space or time. Good example, a very elaborate one is in a um, paper by Jeremy White um, in Water Resources Research in 2014. Now, if you look at the, different, the three different approaches, how they deal with consistency with data, um, in the scenario approach, um, a lot of focus is on uh, some uh, goodness of fit measures, usually focused on root mean squared error. But there is also quite a lot of attention to the professional judgments. So looking at your time series of your produced mo uh, of the model, the water balance, the fluxes, the maps, to see whether they all uh, whether they make sense. Um, if you go to a linear uncertainty analysis, um, it by definition can only take into account uh, something that can be minimized in a squared error sense. So it often is just focusing on the mismatch between the data points, where each data point is weighted based on its uh, observation uncertainty. So uh, it's weighted uh, proportionally to the inverse of it, which means that points with a large uncertainty get a small weight and vice versa. Um, Stochastic approaches are in essence quite 
Uh, similar, a lot of the likelihood functions are also based on squared errors, and often the observation weights are also the, invert, the inverse of the ob observation uncertainty. In both the linear and stochastic approaches, however, um, it is very hard to incorporate that professional judgment and to formalize that. So there are a couple of recent developments like approximate Bayesian computation and evidential belief learning that provide um, approaches to um, bring that professional judgment uh, into your uh, likelihood function so that you can go beyond just how well it matches your, um, your data points. Now, related to that, that entire discussion so far, I have focused it on just the measurement uncertainty. But look, just I'll work you through this simple example. So we've got a, an unconfined aquifer with a, a drainage ditch. Um, you've got two points where you have um, groundwater level observations, H1 very close to the ditch, H2 very far from the ditch. And you're asked to make a prediction of the groundwater level at the black dots, which is pretty much the same distance from that ditch. Now, if I start fitting the first well on the left, you'll see that there's a very wide range of um, water uh, of groundwater levels that can fit into that observation uncertainty, while that's much narrower to the right. And if you then make that prediction of the groundwater level on the left versus the right, you can see that the same um, observation uncertainty will lead to a very different uh, predictive uncertainty, just depending on where the data point is. So. Um, this is again, this has a very practical consideration, for instance, when you're looking at these graphs of observed versus simulated uh, values, uh, observations close to a boundary condition, it will be quite straightforward to match, but doesn't mean that when, they when the match is very good, that the predictive uncertainty is going to be very small. So I'm going to, so I'll just pause here for a moment again to see if there's any yeah. questions coming up. Yeah, there's quite a few on the board lighting up, and um, and we're covering a lot of ground, as you said in the in the, in the beginning, Luke. Um, we realise that a that a webinar of this length is is unlikely unlikely to get to get to too much depth, but it's fantastic to to see that the the, uh, the breadth that you're going to, Luke, and uh, we greatly appreciate it. What we thought was maybe we could run a little poll, and and, and if you could just answer this poll, that'd be that'd be useful. Maybe we could take this topic further in the future if there were enough interest. Uh, so there's a question up there. I would attend an online course on uncertainty analysis in groundwater groundwater modelling projects. Yes or no? Um, so if you could if you could uh, fire that back at us, we'll we'll get a bit of an idea before the um, before the webinar is over uh, who would uh, who would be likely to come. Um, yeah, that, that'd be great if you could do that. And maybe we'll take a couple of these questions now. Would that be okay, Luke? Should yeah, I'm fine. A couple, there's a couple on the board here now. Stephen uh, from New South Wales, a PhD student in New South Wales, has said, uh, how does the subjective probability reflect the acceptance level of risk from stakeholders? So that's, and I, I guess that's where the, um, that's the, the hard part with the subjective probability that it is just uh, an assessment by, an expert or a panel of experts, but I think in terms of the reflecting the, the risk, that's where you need to have that intense dialogue with everybody involved in the modeling project, um, especially the stakeholders. And one of the crucial things, and it's one of the most challenging things in the groundwater mod in these groundwater modeling projects, is to convey that um, that confidence that you have in the results to these stakeholders, so they can appreciate how certain or uncertain you are in these results, so they, they can match that to their own personal risk profile. Yep. Um, Tony Smith from CDM Smith in Perth uh, has asked, um, should we um, distinguish between the probability of an impact occurring, something we can't know unless it's happened before, and the number of model realizations that predict a specific impact? So, oh, thanks for that, Tony. Uh, <laughs> that's, but that, that almost comes to a very, an almost, uh, philosophical approach on how you define um, these probabilities like is there um, an underlying uh, probability of an event occurring that we can never absolutely quantify um, and what is the level and how well can we approximate that with the number of model runs so um, that is a very hard question to tackle on a more practical level um, I think it is important to um, to highlight with the number of model runs, which is basically a code of how well have I searched, how well have I explored that parameter space. And ultimately, the number of model runs is linked to 
um, what you want to predict if you are just after the, the median or the mean value of an event occurring there's not a you can get that with a high level of accuracy with less model runs than a more extreme thing like the 95th percentile so that's another test that you can do is to see if you increase the number of model runs how does your estimate of the mean or your uh, 95th percentile how does that change that's great no thank you very much uh, Tony that's great so back over to you Luke yep okay so that was actually focusing on all of the, the technical sides of the uncertainty analysis. But as I, as I just mentioned, one of the bigger, biggest challenges in all of this is how to present this, how to communicate these results in an efficient way so that stakeholders, people who are not that technically versed in um, the groundwater modeling or know the area that well, that they can appreciate um, what um, the risks and the, the probabilities. Uh, Again, here an example. This is um, a result from uh, the bioregional assessment work that we did. And that's this is really kind of a dashboard approach showing an uncertainty analysis in, in four different ways, using maps, using graphs, using tables, and using text. And that's a very purposeful thing because it's a very personal thing on where you get most of your information. And the best, most efficient way of communicating is making sure that you can, uh, that you provide, that you cater for all of these uh, um, preferences. So the main thing there is that there is no one size that fits all and that the most efficient way is to make sure that you combine maps, tables, graphs and text. And especially with the text, um, it is quite useful to have a calibrated language like for instance these tables that are published by the IPCC where they dis use these subjective terms like likely and link them to a probability interval. Um, there are also drawbacks to this, but at least it will ensure that in your own writing that you can be consistent um, and that you can always map uh, a term back to an actual model outcome and a, mo uh, and a probability result. Um, another thing is try to reduce cognitive strain. And basically what it means is make your results easy to understand. And that's easier said than done, obviously, but, um, but something like a 95% Probability is harder to understand than saying of the thousand models evaluated, less than 50 showed. And that statement that I've got there, it also directly ties into the, that comment Tony made, because rather than hiding behind the probability measure, I'm directly saying this is what we actually did and this is what it actually showed. Um, and a final thing I'll just touch upon in communication is really the importance of framing. Um, this is not a groundwater model uh, example, but just let's say that you go to the doctor and he gives you, let's say, ah, we're going to do an operation on you and there's a 99% likelihood you will survive. You'll take that message very different than that uh, if the same doctor tells you there's a 1% likelihood you will die. Um, and it's just that difference in framing it, although statistically it's exactly the same, makes all the difference. So if you want to uh, present your results in an unbiased way, you have to make sure that you alternate between those two and that you give them equal uh, weight in your how you describe your results. So this is where I'm going to uh, close off on the, the presentation. I'll just list a couple of the take home messages from, from this webinar. And for me, the very, the biggest thing in any groundwater model is really to spend time talking to whoever is involved in the project to exactly and explicitly define what is the event that you're going to model and what are the potential consequences and how is this going to use in, in uh, making management decisions? What is an acceptable probability? Um, so I gave you an overview of a high level overview of uncertainty and, and analysis approaches from scenario to linear to stochastic. Um, but in each of them, it is important not just to focus on the quantitative side of the uncertainty analysis, but uh, to spend time on the qualitative side. Um, documenting and justifying all of the choices that you make. And some of them common to all of these approaches are which parameters to include, what are your prior parameter values and ranges, what do you consider to be an acceptable model, and how to present the results. Now, although these are all model questions or model choices, it's not, the, not just the responsibility of the modeler to take those and to make those decisions. These are decisions that should be taken by everybody involved in the modeling project, by the whoever is managing the project, by the client, by the stakeholders, by the regulator. So it's very important to have these conversations early on 
um, in your modeling project so you don't come to surprises later on. So to finish off, I'll leave you with a couple of textbooks and papers that I uh, found very useful, um, going from um, the theory behind the best suit of software and the dream um, package to um, a text on uh, communication of uncertainty, um, an overview paper on sensitivity analysis, and a very recent book by um, the Center for Reservoir Forecasting in Stanford, which is a really great introduction to everything you want to know about uncertainty analysis in geology. Um, if you've got any questions, I'm happy to take them here, or you yep. can always contact me on my email address listed below. Yep, thank you everyone for answering that, Paul. We really appreciate your responses there. Um, to get right back to the uh, questions for the next 15 minutes, and uh, we'll have to shoot through them fairly quickly. Garth Cooper has asked, how do we uh, include geological uncertainty in ground mo groundwater models such as dikes suddenly appearing? There's a lot of literature about yeah. mathematical uncertainty, but not enough about conceptual uncertainty. And I think, and it is... Um Increasingly recognize that that's actually one of the big gaps is how do you systematically explore conceptual uncertainty and how you, do you um, bring that in in the mathematical way. So there is actually approaches um, where you take different conceptualizations where you um, build models with dikes or without dikes. You give these models also a probability. So as a geologist, the question then is, what is the probability that a dike occurs? And you can then take that on in the same way as you would take any other parameter. Um, but obviously, computationally, that is a very large ask because you're not building one model, but you're now building two models that you have to take to a full uncertainty analysis. Yep, that's great. Thank you, Garth. Uh, Hugh Middlemas here in South Australia uh, has asked, uh, and greetings, Hugh. Thanks so much for taking time here today. What do you mean, says Hugh, what do you mean by acceptable probability in that second to last slide? Given that it is mentioned along with consequence, do you really mean acceptable impact consequence with a specified likelihood of occurrence? And what is that likelihood? Bit of a, a two-step question there. <laughs> uh, thanks for that, you. And I, th I think, um, and as I was going through the presentation, I realized I'm touching on a very, uh, I'm drifting into a very dangerous domain there because that's really where um, regulators sit. But it's really, I guess what I mean with acceptable probability is, this is just for me a term to start a conversation with everybody involved in uh, the groundwater modeling project. So what is the, and to have a discussion on what is um, a likelihood, what is our risk profile? Um, is there a probability, well, or it might be that the, can, uh, that the answer is, well, we can't accept any probability. We can't just have this event happening. So um, to me, I don't, I'm really realizing I'm not answering your uh, question properly, um, but it's just saying that in decision making, uh, ultimately, you will have to put a number on there of what is the event, what is the consequence, and what is the probability that we would accept. And that is a conversation that, again, it's not something that's just a modeler can do. That is a wider conversation that needs to be had. Thanks so much, Hugh. Appreciate that greatly. Um, David Schaefer is, has asked, what is the trade-off or limitations between model run times Sometimes, sometimes just a few hours, and the possibility of effectively undertaking uncertainty analysis in a real-world model. Okay. I, I realize I'm very biased in this, but I will always go for a simpler model and a comprehensive uncertainty analysis in preference over a complex model and a limited uncertainty analysis. Yep, yep, yep. So that's, that's the short answer to that. Uh, thanks so much, David. That was a, it's great. Um, um, Stephen from New South Wales asks, how do the de de deterministic and stochastic models address environmental risk that rarely occur, as rarely occurring events suggest more observations to, to predict them? Okay, and that's, again, still, that's a topic of um, a lot of research for the moment is for these, how do you deal with very extreme values? Um, and it's not something these techniques do well at the moment. And there is a lot of potential for surprise. So um, I can't give you a good answer on this uh, right now, um, but the more extreme an event you go, the more uh, the less likely the traditional approaches are to, well, to characterize them well. Praveen has asked, what type of, of sets of realization of hydraulic conductivity should be in future groundwater modeling and uncertainty analysis? Not really sure what, um, what Praveen is asking here, but Again, to me, it really comes down to spending the time on um, characterizing those priors and especially 
one of the biggest challenges, and that's something that's been around for decades now, is um, how do you move between scales? How you go from um, a small scale slug test or pumping test to a, a hydraulic connectivity value that you can apply in a regional model? Maybe it goes. Maybe it's clearer as he goes. He goes on with the next uh, question: is how how can we minimise the number of simulations? That's again um, a hard question. It also um, there are ways of minimising the number of uh, simulations that you have to do. There's a lot of uh, work on sampling techniques that can be much more efficient. There is ways of doing emulators that reduces the number of original model runs that you need to do. And there are also quite clever uh, parameterization techniques that give you a lot of heterogeneity in your parameter space, but reduce that to a small number of parameters. So again, it's a vast field of academic literature that is dealing with that. And there's various, various approaches to um, minimize the number of model runs that you need to do while still maintain uh, as much complexity in your model. A couple more questions uh, from Alfred. What is the optimum data set to begin a model with? That, again, that really did, um, that, there is no single answer to that question. And um, like the example I gave for the, the Clarence, Clarence Morton, um, I started that initial model with a very brief data set, which basically was summarized in just two pages. Um, and that was more exploratory modeling to explore what is possible. Um, but then going to that three-dimensional model, that's where you really have to start um, digging Deeper. And I think there is, you can start modeling from uh, even before collecting data. And I think there is, that's where that iterative approach needs. There it needs to go that back and forth between um, updating your model and collecting data and making sure that they uh, evolve uh, at the same time. Well, maybe we'll make this the last um, comment or question. I think it's more a comment actually. Can, can increasing observation minimize the uncertainty? Again, a hard one, because I can't make a definitive call on that. There's always, um, like the extreme distribution uh, question earlier, there's yeah. always that potential for that immense outlier that invalidates your entire conceptual model. So in that case, if that happens, you actually increase your predictive uncertainty by collecting more uh, observations. But in yeah. theory, more yeah. observations would reduce your uncertainty. Yeah, now that's great. I think we might leave it there. Uh, you can see the free webinars coming up there in the future. Um, we have good uh, eight or nine there, They're ready to roll between now and, uh, and November. Well, that is it for today. Uh, catch up with us on Twitter at Icewarm at the bottom there you can see. Um, we're so appreciative of you joining us today, Luke, um, taking the time. Uh, enormous amount happening, happening for you at CSIRO, but uh, thank you for taking out this, this time of the day and uh, appreciate you uh, presenting it. This no worries. It was a pleasure. Webinar today. And everyone, thank you for joining us. It'll be great to see you again at a future webinar. Thank you, everyone. See you next time. Bye.